Hello, this is Rachel from 7 and All, and today's video is going to be a what you need to know about Apologia's Young Explorers series, and this is going to be the pros and cons edition of what you need to know about this series. My family is a second generation homeschooling family, and we have been using Apologia science resources for many years. I myself used Apologia Science, their very old editions of their high school science materials throughout my high school years, including their advanced physics, advanced chemistry, all that good stuff. But in this video, I am going to be sticking to just talking about their Young Explorer series specifically, which is aimed at roughly first through sixth grade. pros and the cons that our family has noticed throughout our years of using these science resources. Um, but I do want to point out that what might be a pro to one family might be a con to one family and vice versa. We kind of have different needs and different priorities in our science materials. So let's just get that out of the way to begin with. I do have an affiliate link for Apologia, so I will leave that down in the description. If you're interested in heading to their site, checking out all the different volumes that they have in this series, go ahead, click that link, head over there, and I will get a small percentage of the purchase at no extra cost to you. The first thing that I want to point out is that Apologia Young Explorers is designed to be very flexible with grades and that you can use it with multiple different ages at the same time. This is specifically designed to be a family style science learning resource. You don't have to use a specific volume at a specific grade level. This is a pro in many ways because many families are looking to do family style science. And because science itself is not necessarily a grade specific topic, because mostly you're learning about topics. You're not necessarily building one skill upon another as you do in math or in reading. However, there can be some downsides to the large range of ages and abilities contained in that first through sixth grade age range. I have found that with many family style programs, um, inevitably, sometimes it kind of feels like the kids on either end of the age range, either extreme end of the age range, and be a little bit left out just by the nature of the material. So for example, if you choose the Exploring Creation with Chemistry and Physics, or if you choose to do exploring creation with human anatomy and physiology, or even the earth science one, um, earth science edition of these books. If you're choosing one of these levels specifically, it's probably gonna fit your fifth, sixth, seventh graders um, pretty well. But if you have a first grader, second grader, they might actually end up being a little in over their head. This is just not the most appropriate science topic for a first or second grader. It, it simply is not. Um, it's not insanely hard, but it's just not the most age appropriate topic. First, second grade is when you might be doing more gentle topics um, like animal science, the typical type of science you typically do at that age range. And that's just kind of one of the natural shortcomings that can come up in family style science. Another thing that um, can happen, and I'll just point this out because I was the oldest and gifted child in a large homeschooling family, is when you have significantly older or significantly more advanced children, they just might not cooperate all that well <laughs> with family science and they just might naturally be at a different pace than the rest of the family or they might <laughs> naturally be at a different um, level of interest and level of exploration and it can be hard to really completely adapt something that might fit all the rest of your kids to the needs of your oldest child. So that's just kind of a natural drawback of family style when you have certain situations with oldest or youngest children um, and that's something to be aware of and to just plan for. It's not an unsurmountable obstacle but it's something to be aware of. Okay next is a pro. This is a big pro, especially for us as an overseas homeschooling family. The textbook is completely non-consumable. You are not expected to write in the textbook at all. It's a nice, hardcover, sturdy, full-color textbook. Very engaging, interesting. There's paintings, there's photographs, 
all sorts of stuff going on in here. This is interesting even for kids just to read on their own. And it's non-consumable, so you can use it, and you can use it again with a kid later down the road and use it again. These two volumes have been used with at least two and possibly three of my siblings who have wide age caps in between them. So they've done them individually, but they've been used again and again. On the flip side of that, the con is that the really, really cool student notebooking journals are consumable. And even trying to use them in non-consumable ways, which we have done as a uh, overseas homeschooling family, trying to just write down, like complete the activities in a plain notebook, it doesn't work that well uh, because there are so many cool things like colorful mini books that you get to cut out and glue or staple together. There's a lot of very, they're truly interactive, very interactive activities. And because of that, you pretty much, to make the most of the student notebooking journal, you kind of do have to use it up. It's not something that can be easily um, reused from one kid to another, which for those of you who can easily purchase new materials won't be as much of a con, but for those of us overseas, it can be a little bit more of, oh man, like, this is amazing. I mean, we're cutting out little bugs and making mini books out of them, but that does mean that you have to use up the book. So a little bit of a con, but these are a great resource. Another pro, the textbooks themselves include many, many opportunities for hands-on activities, for experiments that really make the concepts come to life. And so you don't have to be searching Pinterest, you don't have to be searching the internet for hands-on ways to learn about this topic. There's plenty. There's more than probably any family will actually do. You don't really have to expect to do every single activity. On the flip side, these are hands-on activities and sometimes they can actually require a fair amount of supplies. I am not always the kind of person that owns like balloons randomly or tubes or aluminum foil or just, you know, the random household supplies that you are expected to have to complete these activities. So that can be a little bit of a con if you're not the kind of person that has a very well stocked junk drawer. However, there is an option to deal with this. You can actually purchase supply kits specifically designed for each year of Apologia, and I believe it's Home Science Tools that sells them. Another great pro to the curriculum is that they include a schedule. And I know not everyone loves schedules. I personally love schedules. Not that I always feel like I need to stick to them, but they help give me a framework to think, okay, how much should we do in a day? <laughs> how much should we complete? So they have a great little schedule that actually divides it into just two days of science per week over the course of roughly one school year. But um, it's 28 weeks, so it's not a full 36 week school year, which gives you a little time to do some more science if you want to, or you could just do this much science and call it good for the year, <laughs> however you prefer to do it. Do note that to find the schedule, you are going to have to head to the interactive notebooking journal. It's not in the textbook, it is in the journal. That can be a little bit tricky at first. Now, something that is not included in this program are tests. There aren't, you aren't gonna find a test booklet and a test answer key. And for some homeschool families, this isn't gonna be a big deal because you don't like to use tests. For others, um, other homeschool families and other students actually find tests to be a very helpful tool. For students who struggle with um, knowing what they really know, or students who struggle with overconfidence of, yeah, 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 I know this, but they can't actually tell it back, they can't, they actually haven't mastered it, sometimes having a simple test can be a great tool to help kids realize, oh, I don't know this material as well as I thought I did. So we have had students in our homeschool family that actually benefit a great deal from the tool that tests can be. This program does not include tests, but after each of the lessons, which there's something like 14 or so lessons in a year, so you spend a few weeks on one lesson. At the end of each lesson, there is a what do you remember review section, again, in the student interactive notebooking journal. You could opt to use these in a way. If you do this in a closed book test format, you could use these as tests. And that could be a good option for your upper elementary child or your child who just really benefits from having the challenge in front of them of, hey, can you actually remember this information when it's not right in front of you? 
to what level have you actually mastered this information? So that's one option to uh, make tests. You could also invent your own way of testing or do end of chapter, end of lesson reports. You have your own options, definitely, um, but it doesn't come with pre-made tests in the way that you might think from a more traditional curriculum like a Becca. One pro that I've already mentioned is that the textbooks are extremely colorful, detailed, engaging. They are not boring and endless reading. They are divided up into different sections. Try this, questions, discussion questions, lots of photographs and pictures. So there's a lot of interest in these textbooks. They are not dry. They're very colorful and interesting. However, one con with this program is that there are no integrated literature suggestions. For many families, they do like to incorporate living books, different kinds of science books, maybe from nonfiction writers like Gail Gibbons, from well-known nature writers like Jim Arnosky. I love his books. So if you want to incorporate some of those picture books or different types of science literature, you won't be able to find the recommendations specifically in here. You're going to have to do some of your own research and planning. You might be able to find blog posts or resources created by other homeschool parents of good suggestions for um, literature on these themes. Definitely, you know, ask your friends, <laughs> check the internet. You're not without resources to find those books, but they won't be included in the curriculum itself. One more pro of this curriculum is that it is very thorough and detailed. Each year is following a particular theme. So you're learning about chemistry and physics, or you're learning about anatomy, or you're learning about flying creatures. You're learning about outer space. So you're following a certain theme, but within that theme, they do a lot. You are going to come out of this feeling like this is quite a thorough elementary science curriculum. It doesn't really skimp on the information. They give you a lot. Now, for some families, that could become a bit of a con, especially if your children are very young. It might feel a little bit too much. And the student notebook, there's a lot of amazing activities, a lot of opportunities to engage with the material. It could also feel like a lot. It could feel like too much. That's when I would suggest don't start necessarily too early or too young if you don't have eager, <laughs> very eager learners, very eager, eager to just gobble this up. Sometimes young kids really gobble up science. I have young boys who do gobble up <laughs> science um, topics and materials. So I'm not saying that all young kids will necessarily struggle with this, but it could feel like a lot, especially if your kids are all on the younger end of the age range. Another thing I wanted to point out is that many families are concerned about the idea of staying on one topic for a full year. How could we learn about space for a full school year? Or how could we study flying creatures for a full school year? I do want to point out each of these topics is actually really big. People could study space for an entire career. <laughs> People could study birds for their entire lifelong career. You know, like these, these literally, these <laughs> subject matter, the subject areas are actual careers. So let's not take too limited a view of, oh, it's, it would be way too long <laughs> to spend a whole school year studying one topic. I know that people's opinions can vary on that, um, but within these topics, there are so many areas. In the Flying Creatures book, you're learning about bats, you're learning about uh, dinosaurs, different types of insects, butterflies, and other flying beetles. You're also learning about birds. So like within that Flying Creatures topic, there are many different topics to learn about. So I, for one, would not be too concerned about staying on one topic and diving in deep and getting all the details over one year. I I don't really feel like it's going to get boring, but I also am not the kind of person that gets easily bored <laughs> by this type, type of thing. Okay, I hope that this was helpful and gives you a good full picture of the Young Explorer series. If you have any more questions, feel free to leave them down in the comments below. And remember, you can head to my link, um, my affiliate link for Apologia to check out their website and see the information that they have to offer about their resources. And I will be seeing you next time for more nerdy homeschool videos. Bye.